little bit about what Kent Money does. Kent initially had an idea of trying to get Christmas cards just into a couple prisons, just into North Central and Marion right next door, and maybe the women's prison. God was saying to him, here it became such that he, he just felt like God was saying to him, no, don't stop there. See if you can do every incarcerated person. And so he put that out, and we started praying about getting cards, Christmas cards, for every incarcerated person, male or female, in the state, men, women, or child, in the state of Ohio. And he got more than enough. And he thought, he had so many, he thought, well, let me reach out to a couple other folks in other states. And he's got cards to go to California. He's got cards to go to Illinois. He's got cards to go to different places. But they give Christmas cards, hand-delivered Christmas cards, unless they refuse them, to every incarcerated prison, not, not jail, every incarcerated person in the state of Ohio gets a message about the love of Christ from some member like you in some small church or some large church that says, just want you to know I'm praying for you. Kent also, and not only does he does the, the rap, uh, the Christian rap thing, he also, they started a basketball ministry. Can you imagine this? So Kent started taking in, he just asked if with his Christian rap class if they could get some basketball players to go in and play basketball against some of the residents. We'll call them inmates, call them residents. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? But Aaron Kraft, a uh, former Ohio State ball player, was invited by one of the young men who we've gotten to know and the Grove City, Res Grove City kid, Corey Martin, invited Aaron Kraft and some other folks, and they go into different prisons. They go into North Central. They go into Orient. And they play basketball against these leaders. It's incredible. They're asking them to do it in multiple, in multiple prisons around the state because what it does is it, it, they build a relationship, then they have a, they have a game, they have a relationship, and then it just it, it breaks down some of these barriers that just become wars. All because Kent said, well, how, how can God use me to bless lives? Me, one guy. And we've started praying. It kind of has the impact of things like we saw last Sunday or last Monday night, right? When DeMar Hamlin got injured. How many of you prayed for that young man? How many of you know people who prayed for that young man? Did God answer? Did you expect him to? I did, right? See, we as believers got to a point where we said, you know, God, I, I, I don't know whether you're going to choose to do it, but we're going to ask, and we're going to ask honestly, and we're going to ask boldly, right? And he was out of it for days, right? Here's first question. Here's the first question. Did we win? <laughs> Who won the game? And his doctor said to him, you won the game of life, my friend. So now he's coming to see all the people who were going to the Father, Son, and Spirit on his behalf. What a witness, right? Why do we ever fight about praying? Because, you know, there are coaches who've been fired for taking their teams on the field to pray or on the court to pray. Or on the... Isn't that amazing? You fire somebody, go to the Supreme Court, you get fired for praying, and yet every one of those Bills players and every one of those Bengals players and every person in those stands what do they do? It didn't become an issue then, did it? Sometimes all it takes is a reframe of your own personal circumstance to shake you and me back to a reality of who God is. That's what I'd like to do today. I want to reframe some things. I want to reframe some things in your mind and in my mind some things that we know and probably take for granted that I want us to never take for granted again. And I'm going to use some unconventional means to do it. Thanks. You're welcome. Here's all I'd like you to do. I'll, I don't want you to say anything. All I want you to do is in your mind, I want you to ask yourself the question, what does January 6th mean to you as a believer in America 
What does January 6th represent to you? In your mind. Just get your pictures in your mind. What images do you see? What things do you experience? January 6th in America, 2023, as a believer. All those are key words. You got them, don't you? How many of your mind went to the news? With the stuff that happened? How many went to Washington, D.C.? How many went to Congress? How many went to imagery of craziness? Yeah, right? Okay, let me, let me keep building on this. This is important. I'm going to build on it. I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 42. Let's build on it. Isaiah 42, I want to read some things to you and, let me, and, and see if this helps. See if this helps with your, what does, it, what does January 6th mean to you? Let's see if this fits. Isaiah, this is the scripture for the day, one of the scriptures for the day. It says this, Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Here is my servant whom I am of hold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets, or a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. But in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands or the nations put their hope. Wow, right? Does that kind of help? Does it help with your imagery? January 6th, as a Christian in America? Because, you know, let's just, let me just put a little, a little emphasis, emphasis on a couple of these words, right? Three times in this, these four verses, you see the concept of whoever this is bringing justice or bringing forth justice or establishing justice. So you get the impression that justice is important to God. Would you get that impression from this? Especially if it's his servant whom he's chosen, whom he delights, whom he says, I will put my spirit on him. Hmm. And, and just for clarity, a couple of verses later it says this, I the Lord have called you in righteousness, he's speak, telling us who he's speaking about. He says, I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you and I will make you a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. So let me ask you, does anybody know who that's referring to? The one who was a covenant for all the people and a light to the Gentiles. Correct. Jesus, right? We'll come back to that. It's important. So do you see the themes? You see the themes? The themes there are relationships that are based in unity, right, in, in Isaiah 42? Re relationships that are based in unity, relationships that are not obnoxious, not crying out and pointing fingers. You're not, relationships that, that are gentle to the broken and the disenfranchised. A bruised reed he won't break and a, a, a smoldering flax he won't snuff out. People who are going through weaknesses, he won't hurt them, right? And he'll be faithful to bring justice, right? So you get the impression, if that's talking about Jesus, that justice is important to Jesus. Would everybody agree with me? You know I'm setting you up, right? Okay, good. Because it's true. Luke 4, very first message, you see Jesus, he, he, after he said repent and be baptized, right? Or repent and believe. The kingdom of heaven in his hand. He goes into the temple that day and they hand him a scroll. They hand him a scroll. He rolls it open and he finds the place where it says this. What we have written on the walls of our church. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Bruce Reed, smoking flax. To comfort those who mourn. To bind up the brokenhearted. Smoldering flax he won't put out. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to release captives and to set prisoners free. Think justice, that kind of thing matters to Jesus? It does, doesn't it? It really does. What a great message for January 6th in 2023 America. I could give this sermon any day, couldn't I? I could use January 6th and I could talk about it, right? And it would make perfect sense. And for many people, the date of January 6th has been forever reframed in America. 
you went to the place I thought you would go. All of you. Some of you probably say, well, I don't really want to go there, so I'm not going to go there. I know he probably means something else, but you, your mind couldn't get the images out of your head. We all know. You went there because January 6th now has a specific meaning. Two years later, after some catastrophically stupid event, right? Yep. So in the 21st century, going forward in America, January 6th, as long as it remains this way, is going to default in people's minds to that event. But here's a question. What did January 6th mean in the other 20th, 20 centuries? What did January, 20, what January 6th refer to in the first 20 centuries, first 2,000 years or so of Christian life? Hmm. Anybody know? Raise your hand if you think you know or if you know. This is interesting because this is, this is what happens. There are things that, that go on in our world and, and very quickly things that we should as Christians be really moved by get covered over and we need to rediscover them. It's literally what the word discover means, to remove the cover. So many things that should have great import to us as believers get covered over by life get covered over by humanity, get covered over by our way of doing stuff and the stuff that we think is important, and it needs to be discovered. It needs to be removed, have the cover removed so that we can see it fresh. Today, Janu on January 6th, most Christians ought to have their minds immediately go to what we call epiphany. Okay, how many is that a new word? I mean, it's, it's a word that you don't know a whole lot about. Come on, be honest. You don't know a whole lot about epiphany. I didn't either for a long time. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know a whole lot about it either. But what is epiphany? Epiphany, January 6th, is a date in the Christian world, all around the world, that celebrates the revelation of Jesus as king. Some people in the world call it Three Kings Day. Three kings? Who are the three kings? Remember the three kings? Three wise men? They came. Things have it as they came on January. They arrived on January 6th. They celebrate the three kings who came to come. Because they didn't come when he was in the manger. They came when he was in the house, as Scripture says. And they brought from the east, they brought gifts to him, right? They brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We've conflated them into the Christmas story or into the, 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 the nativity story. But they came, and they were, that was the revelation that Jesus was the king of the Jews. Remember when he went to Herod, and he said, where is the one born king of the Jews? That was said to be, it's celebrated on January 6th throughout the world. An epiphany means the revelation or the revealing. When you have an epiphany, you have a revelation of something. It's the revelation of Jesus as king. Wow. I didn't know that for a long time. But I don't want you to ever forget it. Because January 6th, for a Christian in America should mean what it has meant for nearly 20 centuries, not what it's meant for two years. We should celebrate the revelation of Jesus as king. It's also a day that celebrates Jesus' baptism. It's a day that celebrates Jesus' baptism. Now, that's a weird thing, right? You ever wonder why Jesus got baptized? You ever think about that? Did Jesus need to be baptized? Why did he? Huh. If he did it, that means it's important to him. So if it was important to Jesus, should it be important to us? How important? How important should baptism be to you and to me, 
to believers, to Christians. How many of you know your baptism date? You know, we were just out in California, the Baps and us, and we took, were you, were you baptized in, in the front room too, Lisa? You were too, right, honey? The four of us were baptized in the same place. And we took our kids, we took Lex and Cassidy, and we showed them the space where we were baptized. It was cool. They got to see where we dedicated our lives to Christ. They got to see where Karen and I got married. We took a revival kiss in that spot. <laughs> Saw where Bob and Lisa got engaged. They did a reenactment. It was kind of cool. It took Bob a while to get up, but it was cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They celebrated so much of our lives. We celebrated dates. I remember the date I got engaged. I got engaged on March 30th, 1987. I know that because that was the anniversary date of Karen's baptism. She thought I was taking her out to dinner for her baptism celebration. Bah! <laughs> baptism should be important to us. How important is it to you? Really, because how important is baptism in the Christian world today? I can tell you that in the 12 years that I've been here, how many sermons have you ever heard me give on baptism? This is telling, isn't it? Shame on me. Shame on me for not giving the value of something that was so important to Jesus that he didn't even need to do it, and he did it, and that the Christian church is celebrated and focused on as a sacred thing or a sacrament, two basic sacraments, two basic sacred things, baptism, communion, sacred to the Christian church. It's two things that all Christian churches have in common, baptism, communion. But here's what's funny. How many people treat baptism as sacred? So sacred that you even remember it. Or communion. How many people treat, how many of us can treat communion as sacred? Or just what we do the second week of the month? Or every week, depending on where you are? I want to reframe this. I want to reframe this because I would like us to reclaim the value and the importance of these things. The Christian church has celebrated for two, nearly 2,000 years the baptism of Jesus on January 6th. It celebrated the revelation because it was on that date that from heaven it was announced who he was. It was announced to the, to the shepherds, right? Born this day is the, you know, is, is the Messiah. But on his baptism, let's look at it. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. We read this. Then Jesus came down from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. Jesus specifically went down to the Jordan to find John the Baptist to be baptized by him. And John tried to deter him, said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I, don't, I need to be baptized by you. You don't need to be baptizing by me. Be baptized by me. Jesus replied, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness, and only then John consented. He said, okay, I'll do it. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up from the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. Get this moment. At that moment, heaven opened. I don't know what that looks like. But he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove on Jesus. And then they heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Can you imagine being present that day? Would that day matter? Would that day matter in the life of people that you saw heaven open, a dove come down and lay down and come down on somebody, and you hear a voice that says, that's my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. God himself saying who Jesus was. See that proclamation? This was important. Jesus said this is important. 
Remember I showed you the justice word? Justice was written three times in Isaiah 42. Look what's written, what's talked about three times. It's just a coincidence. But three times here, you see Jesus went to the Jordan to be baptized. But John tried to deter him, say, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, 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 let it be so. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, baptism is important in this moment. Is it important in the 21st century in America? Is it important in the Christian church in the 21st century? I submit to you, not as important as it should be. And I ask your forgiveness over the last 12 years for not speaking about it like I should. Father, forgive me for not giving the weight to baptism and communion that I should. We should be telling all of our kids, not you need to get baptized, but about the power of baptism and what it means. It changes everything. Lexi shouldn't have to learn about baptism from some, some campus minister. She should be learning it from her mom and dad, but also from, from me. Cassie shouldn't be learning about baptism from a play that they're doing. She should learn about baptism from us. She should hear about it in her children's church class or youth church classes. Why don't we talk about baptism? You know why? Because in some cases, it's like baptism has become entrance into the club. Because that's how we see Christianity sometimes. And then, well, you don't want to talk about baptism because that's how you get people entered into the club. So, you know, we don't really need to be baptized. You just got to do good things. If, if you live out justice, if you live out the way of justice, man, you, you can just live out the way of Jesus and help people find justice. You're a good person. But you're not a Christian. The only way to be a Christian the only way to be a Christian is to be washed in the blood of Jesus symbolically in baptism and to accept him as Lord and Savior, as master and as high priest and as king, and to have your identity changed. That is the only way. That's the only way to be my brother or my sister in Christ. Other than that, you're my neighbor. That's good because God tells me I need to love my neighbor. But that is the distinction. The distinction between brother and sister in Christ and neighbor is a committed relationship that happens through baptism. We need to talk about that. It's not something that we should ignore ever. Jesus didn't. This is one of the first things we read about Jesus. He sought John the Baptist out to be baptized by him because he says, it fulfills all righteousness to do it. He didn't have to be baptized. We get baptized for what reasons? Help me understand. Forgiveness of sin. What else? Anything else? Okay, I'll come back to that. Look at those key events, though. On that day that is celebrated on January 6th, heaven opened. Right, hear me stop here. Heaven opened. I've never, I saw some beautiful sunsets out in California. I've seen some beautiful things in Israel. I've seen some beautiful things other places. I've never seen heaven open and the spirit come down like a dove and a voice say, that's my son. I love him. If I had, that day would be a day to remember. Would you agree? Okay. Jesus said it needed to be done that way to fulfill all righteousness. He never sinned. We do. So he did it for us. His washing, his baptism was for us. So that our baptism can have meaning. See, we're not baptizing into ourselves. All of you who were baptized in the Grace Community International Worldwide Church of God, you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You weren't baptized into a church. You were baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Because only that way are you made whole. Jesus had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And so January 6th is celebrated around the world as Jesus' baptism as his proclamation as king from the people in the world and from God himself. 
And by that, he brings justice. Not justice like the world brings justice. See, if you go back and you read the end of Isaiah 42, at the end of Isaiah 42, he says there's some stuff they didn't pick up. They didn't understand that the reason that God needed to bring justice was because he's the one who allowed them to go into captivity because they forgot or they neglected their relationship with him and he allowed them to go into captivity. They didn't pick that up. They didn't, they didn't learn that. They had rebelled against him. They had denied him. They had let other stuff get in the way. And Jesus, God was saying, I want them to see me fresh. I am going to send one who is going to restore all of that, including their hearts. Baptism is important. The epiphany is important. This season, epiphany in, in the Christian calendar lasts a few, it lasts up until we get into the Lenten season where we start focusing on preparation for the recognition of his death and resurrection. In the meantime, what we want to do is we want to take a little time to bask in the glory of being beloved children of God. See, people now, instead of celebrating their birthdays, they now celebrate birthday months. Anybody know people do that? It's my birthday month, and they, they got a whole celebration thing going on. Birthday week, right? What if you celebrated your transformation by God for a month? What he did in your life for a month. Huh. I asked Donnie if he remembered his baptism date. He did. November 1, 2013. I asked Melinda if she remembered her baptism date. She had two of them. So one was here and one was in the Jordan River at the Sea of Galilee on June 18th of last year. Beautiful thing. It was an absolute beautiful thing. To watch her dedicate her life, several others that day. What does baptism mean today, though, for you? Huh. Why do we get baptized? Let me talk to you. Here's why we get baptized. Because baptism shows that we need God. You get baptized because you are ready to acknowledge that you need God. Because you are broken jacked up human being in need of repentance. You need to ask God to forgive you, not just of what you do, but of who you are. We get baptized as a way of acknowledging our need for God. Because even at your best, it ain't good enough. Never will be. We get baptized we submit to baptism as a means of acknowledging our surrender of our lives to the lordship of God. Meaning, you don't run your life anymore. The reason you should remember your baptism date is because that's the day you told God you don't run your life anymore. The reason we don't remember that date is because we run in our lives. Baptism is to remind us that we have surrendered our lives to God, he is the Lord, he runs things. He's not just our savior, he runs things. He runs your life, he runs my life. The reason we go through baptism is to remind ourselves of our true identity. You don't have any other identity that is more important than being a beloved child of God. Beloved son or daughter of God. There is no other part of your identity that matters. Because if you are not a beloved child of God, if you don't recognize that relationship, I feel sorry for you. And there are a lot of people who live their lives who don't know they're loved by God. You know, that's why it's important for us to talk about it. Because even though the enemy tries his best to kind of confuse us and get us all wrapped up in ourselves, we always get to default back and get back to that space where we can feel the love of God in our lives. We can always make our way back. It takes time sometimes, but we can make our way back, no matter how bad it gets. Baptism is a reminder of your true identity. It is the, that, that moment where God spoke over you. I love Jason. He's my son. 
I love Tammy. She's my daughter. I'm pleased with her. Mm. Spoken over you. And we get baptized. We go through baptism as a constant reminder of our new status. What status is that? Whole, clean, free. There is nothing that can imprison you ever again, ever. Mind, body, soul. Nothing can imprison you ever again when you're in Christ. Romans 8 says, there is no thing in all of heaven or earth that can separate you from the love of God. Not height, not depth, not principalities, not powers, not angels, not demons, not life, not death. There is no, no persecution, no famine, no sword. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of God. That is your new status. You are always able to be in relationship and reached by God. Always. And until he says you're not, that's the truth. But that's not how we see baptism today. In America, we look for people get baptized so we can count the numbers and tell me people we got in the church. No. Baptism is about how many lives have been transformed and can talk about it and can share it and can see it and can make a, an incredible difference of it. See, it's one thing to, to, to be able to do good works. It's another thing to do them as a means of helping people come to find out who God has made them to be. <laughs> In Acts 2, after Peter had given the Holy Spirit came, that was another one of those moments we call it Pentecost, that moment where the Spirit came down again, but this time like fire on people, and it just kind of, set them ablaze, and their lives were different, their voice was different, the way they operated was different. And Peter gave this message, and these people said, what do we do now, brothers? And he says, I want you to repent and, and be baptized. Acknowledge that you need a change of your mind. And you know, there comes a point when you're, when you're young that you don't always see what that really means. But we need to help them see it at the age that they can and help them continue to see it at the age that they grow. That we need a change of mind. And that this washing is necessary. We have a daily reminder. Hopefully it's daily. When you bathe each day, you have a daily reminder of life dirt. Don't you? A daily reminder of life dirt. When you brush your teeth every day, it's a daily reminder of needing to clean your mouth. Daily reminder. We got plenty of them. You know what they really point to? The cleansing that comes from Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10 talks about the whole nation of Israel that got baptized in the Red Sea. But it also says that after that, God was with them, and by day he led them by pillar of fire, and by night he led them by, by day by pillar of cloud, and by night by pillar of fire. You know what that means? That every day they had to follow God. Every day they had to lift their eyes and they had to see God throughout all the whole day, and the whole night. You realize that's what it means for you and me. That this thing, when you gave your life, or when you asked God to, to take over your life, here's what it said. It says, I will look to you throughout the day and throughout the night. And I will constantly be looking to change my mind, to have my heart changed about stuff. It's not an entry point into the church. It's a transformational entry point into a relationship with Jesus that you will never be the same and nobody you ever deal with will ever be the same. And it's the only way you can do it. Baptism is so important. I remember the day I graduated. I remember the day I got married. I remember my birthday. I remember the day I got hired. In my first job out of college, it was March 30th, same day. I remember so many things. I remember my, my baptism date too, December 3rd. Why is it easier to remember days we get promoted or days you sign the letter of intent 
or the day you got the bonus or the day you started your business or the day you graduated with your master's? Why is it easy to remember all those dates? But not. And even celebrate those. And not the day of your baptism. I'm going to challenge you. Put that one on your calendar. And every year tell somebody about it. It's vital. It just is. It just is. Mm. There are two sacraments, two sacred things, baptism and communion. For the last 20 centuries, baptism and communion were considered sacred. You know they're now considered common? Most people treat baptism like it's common. Oh, it's a big day, but it really ain't a big day. Because we're pushing toward it. How many, people, how many people are working toward that? How many people is that something that you really want to be a part of? How many, how many people is, are you really trying to live out your baptism, live out your commitment to Jesus? Communion. It's what we do. But for the last 20 centuries, they were considered sacred. What is sacred in your life? What does sacred mean? Sacred should mean it is something that is devoted to God and has that kind of weight. Marriage is another sacrament. It's supposed to be sacred. But I just want to say, when you think about the things of God that are, that are sacred, they should be. Have you noticed that humanity has found ways to muddy them? The celebration of the birth of Christ, he's a sideshow to all the other stuff. People say, I celebrate Christmas. And Jesus is a sideshow. Because everything else. Easter. Right? The resurrection. The celebration of the resurrection is a sideshow. Sometimes. Do all the other stuff. Not to say it's evil. Just saying, is it sacred? Are we putting the emphasis on the thing that, that really drives us to God? And humanity in itself is always going to seek, in the end, or the enemy, the enemy is always going to seek to muddy the waters about the things that are important to God. You can pick them, pick lots of stuff. The cross, the rainbow, um, baptism, the church, the terms, Christian, they don't worship. None of these things mean what they're intended to mean. Just like January 6th. In America right now, I wonder how many people thought about the epiphany or Three Kings Day or the baptism of Jesus. But I wonder how many of you will going forward. 